Good morning, Plymouth and friends. Welcome back to week three of God's Farmer's Market, the Fruit of the Spirit. Last week, we dove right on into love, and that love was represented by lemons at God's Farmer's Market. So now we're going to squeeze those lemons and turn them into lemonade as we talk about our next fruit of the Spirit, joy. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verses 7 through 10. Listen now. Go, eat your bread with enjoyment, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has long ago approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Do not let oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that are given you under the sun, because that is your portion and life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Here ends this reading of scripture. May God help us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Will you pray with me? Oh God, now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Oh God, you are our rock. You are our redeemer. Amen. You wouldn't catch on to this fact by the small chunk that we just read, but when you really start to read the book of Ecclesiastes, you quickly find out that it is not the most optimistic of all the books of the Bible. And that's probably an understatement. It is, however, very honest. According to rabbinic tradition, the book of Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon. And Solomon has a couple of main points that he's really trying to hammer home. Before and after this section that we read this morning, Solomon is focusing on one of those main points. Here it is. The idea that life is fleeting and we're all going to die whether we like it or not, and who knows what happens after we die. Solomon isn't so cheery, is he? Throughout the book, Solomon is constantly emphasizing the superiority of any life at all over death. Take, for example, right before our reading for today in verse 4, where he says, Whoever is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. He doesn't stop there. He continues by saying that the living have it better because at least they know they're going to die. Whereas when you're dead, you don't know anything at all. And don't you worry. He keeps going by saying not only are you going to die, but even the memory of you is going to die. And then he ends this very honest rant about death in verse 6 by saying, yes, your body is going to die, and yes, the memory of you is going to die, but also everything that made you, you, is also going to die. You will never again enjoy the things you enjoyed during your time under the sun. Yikes. As I said, this clearly is not the most optimistic or inspiring part of the Bible. He really beats this dead horse or in his case, this dead lion. He really hammers this point home. But that's why verses 7 through 10, the ones we read this morning, are so surprising to me. After all these verses that came before, I really thought that he would say something like this next. So who cares what you do while you're alive? This pursuit of truth and love that you're striving and searching for is just silly. But he doesn't say that. Instead, he says what we heard in our reading. So go eat your bread with enjoyment and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has long ago approved what you do. 
And no, this isn't saying God approves of all human choices. No, it's saying exactly what it says. God approves of this ineradicable human desire for happiness and joy in a merry heart. This says finding and practicing joy is not just allowed by God, but is expected by God, approved of, commended even by our God, the God that created us. Our creator God declared that it was good on the seventh day. Those six days of work culminated in this last day where God found rest and joy and basked in what God's self declared as good. Now, obviously, it's not all supposed to be unicorns and rainbows. God did have those six other metaphorical days of work. And for us, of work, of hardships, of grief or worry. And those days aren't always just 24 hours, are they? Nope, those days can be weeks, months, or whole seasons of our lives. We might understand this right now during our six months of the pandemic better than we ever did before. Yet the God in whose image we are made found joy and goodness on the Sabbath. Hence, our desire, our yearning for joy and a merry heart, despite of it all. But maybe you're like me, and have had some trouble with joy over the past few months. Maybe you found yourself so incredibly full of joy when you happen to see someone you haven't seen in months, but you feel your heart sink when you can't give a hug or a touch. Their face half-covered, unable to see any smile, and no plans of ever seeing each other again. Or maybe you've had trouble with joy when you get together with friends or family on Zoom or FaceTime, and you find yourself in the quiet moments, missing the people who are technically right in front of you. Or maybe you've had some trouble with joy when you catch yourself actually feeling it, and soon enough the guilt sets in when you remember the dumpster fire that is burning all around us. Joy is complex, people of God. Turns out practicing joy can actually be really hard sometimes. You see, we stand from this pulpit most Sundays preaching about how we as Christians are oftentimes asked to take the high road or the harder road. We preach the important message of how we need to take up our cross and follow. We share stories about how the actions and words of Jesus were countercultural, and how he ruffled quite a few feathers, and that in order to do the work we are called to do in this world, we might just have to ruffle a few feathers ourselves. We share how we struggle to be a disciple of Christ, because being a disciple of Christ can be really hard sometimes. And we preach that the gospel is love, but that loving our enemies is most definitely not an easy vocation. Friends, I've preached that sermon. I think all of your pastors have preached that sermon, and they're really good sermons. These are messages that we have to preach, and I have no doubt that I will preach another one very soon. But also, here is the message that it is okay to be joyful. It is a faithful response to seek joy and take some time to bask in a merry heart when you find it. Even amidst the dumpster fire, it is good and right to practice joy. Because joy can be complex it too can be really hard, but it can also offer us life. It can fill us up. Joy can nourish us in the journey. 
That being said, the whole of Solomon's advice doesn't really sit well with me. He's saying that in the face of death and amidst the chaos and uncertainty of life, grasp on to those moments of joy. Hold on tight to that which brings you merriment because life is fleeting. You're going to die. Is death it? We have these joyful moments that we cling on to in life and then that's it? People of God, how cool is it that we know more of the story. What if instead of this clear-cut, straightforward birth, life, death, whatever the great mystery is after that, we instead claim the eternity that starts right now in this very moment? What if we remember God breaking in and becoming one of us in Jesus Christ, just so we might take on part of his identity and live forever in communion with God. Live forever. Right now. That's not fleeting life or fleeting joy. That's forever. Starting right now. That's God breaking in and offering us eternal life each and every day. We get to experience that unfolding of eternal life each and every day. Praise God, that sure makes me joyful. Amen. In my experience, those who truly understand the deepness and fullness of joy the most are children. Now, I'm not much of a YouTuber, but there was this short video that circulated around the internet back in 2015. And it's only six seconds long, but it gets me every single time. There's this little boy sitting on the floor of what looks to be his living room or family room, and he's probably only three or four years old, and his baby brother is trying to crawl around behind him. We don't know what the holiday is. It could be Christmas or his birthday, but we see that maybe a few other presents have been opened because of the crumpled up paper on the floor around him. So he's sitting on the floor, and he's got the bottoms of his little feet pressed together. And he begins to tear into this gift that he's carefully set between his little legs. It only takes him a few seconds of tearing at the paper before you see his eyes just light up. He flashes this huge smile and holds his gift in the air and says, It's an avocado! Thanks! That's the end of the video. This little boy was so excited about his avocado. He loved it. His eyes couldn't believe what he had just received. He held it out and he smiled at it. And he expressed his cutest, little-voiced, heartfelt gratitude for it. We don't know what happened after the video cut off. He could have asked his parents if he could eat it right away. He could have carried it around all day in his pocket like some kids do with their toys. He could have gotten curious to see if it would bounce and thrown it with all of his might against the floor or the wall or maybe his little brother. Or he could have forgotten all about it and played with one of the other toys that he had opened that day. We don't know. What we do know is that that moment of joy was pure and true, and he surely had a merry heart. This little boy's joy in the gift of his avocado actually has quite a bit in common with our scripture for this morning. His avocado is a gift, but it's also food, just like the wine and bread that we are told to enjoy. It's something ordinary that we need in order to live and fuel us for our day's work. And it's easy to see something like consuming a meal as purely necessary in order to keep going, rather than as a gift or a moment of joy. I mean, when's the last time you looked at your two-day-old pandemic leftovers and said, Woohoo! Can't wait to eat that! 
But have you ever watched a child's face when a birthday cake is set down right in front of them? Or a piece of pizza as big as their face? I've realized that for most children, each day is a new adventure. A whole other day to wonder, play, laugh, ask questions. They wake up expectant for more, not clinging to yesterday. They seek joy, yes, but they also don't question if more joy or happiness will come when the last one ends. Children have a lot to teach us. These joys are gifts, but you don't have to hold on to them so tightly. Likewise, we don't have to take stock of all of our hurt and the things we are so certain of and drag them along with us. Don't cling to these things, because God promises that each day is new. It's because God sent us Jesus to become one with us that we get to experience the unfolding of eternal life each and every day. So you can open your hands. You can take the daily manna and find the joy that's within it. You can go eat your bread with enjoyment and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has refreshed you to head out to do the work of tomorrow. Amen.